Good afternoon, Southern. Good afternoon. Oh, you can do better. Good afternoon, Southern. Good afternoon. This is normally my nap time. Even when I'm on campus, I just push my door closed. And one time I was laying down there on the floor, and one of my colleagues flung the door open and hit me right on the top of my head. Luckily, I have a lot of padding here, so I turned out to be okay. But we'll see. I'm really excited to be sharing with you today. And I'm super excited for the SOAR project and the, the invitation from Christy, Stephanie, and Rachel, as well as President Smith. Very excited to be here. I see another familiar face in the crowd. Hello, Lisa. Phenomenal, phenomenal leaders you have on campus. And I just ran into one of my buddies from Academy in the back uh, before the session. Jason, wave hi to everyone, Broadview Academy alum. So I feel like I'm in good company today. But I also must introduce you to some of my other friends that I brought from Kennesaw, who's been traveling with me for, for quite some time. Say hello to Brenda and Melinda. <laughs> They've been with me since uh, my time in upstate New York. I taught for some time at Niagara University, and they've been helping me in the classroom, and I'm hoping they'll help me out a little bit today. There's, there's a story behind them. Melinda and Brenda I use in the classroom to talk about some very sensitive and very controversial issues, very emotionally charged subject, and as you know, you've probably guessed that issue is race. And I use Brenda and Melinda to begin to get students to think about an important topic, um, race, and how it impacts us, how we develop racial attitudes at a very, very early age, having no one to sit down and to tell us how to become racist, how to de develop prejudice, and how to be biased, yet we have these deep-seated beliefs and feelings. Where do we get those from? So there's a story I share with my students. In New York City in the 1940s, there was a sociologist by the name of Kenneth Clark. And Kenneth Clark had that same fundamental question. Where do we receive our education about racial bias, seeing that no one sits down, well, very few people sit down, and teach their children explicitly to be racist? How do we develop these biases in our lives, right? So he developed this experiment using these dolls, and he would get these kids from Harlem and the surrounding community, white kids, Latino kids, and black or African-American kids in large numbers. They would come into his lab, and he would sit them down in front of these dolls, dolls similar to these. And he would ask them, when you see this black doll, what do you think about? When you see this white doll, what do you think about? And when they saw the white doll and they respond to his questionnaire, they would say adjectives like that doll is beautiful, that doll is smart, that doll is nice, that doll is kind. And then he would ask them the same questions about the black doll. And when the children, these are little children, remember, were asked the same questions about the black doll, they would respond by saying, that doll is ugly, that doll is mean. That doll is stupid. That doll is evil. And then he would end those sessions by asking the student, or the, the child rather, which of those dolls looks most like you? And they would note as with a look of anguish on their, on their faces, many of those black students would look at that black doll and recognize that the same types of beliefs and attitudes that they projected onto that doll that society had given to them, they now were confronted with realizing society targeted them in that same way. So today I brought Brenda and Melinda to help me out, not only to talk a little bit about how we talk about race, how we approach this very um, emotionally draining subject, this intellectually um, difficult subject, um, but also to help us think about the ways we can unpackage the histories that we have embedded in our minds, in our culture, and in our worldviews. So what I'm going to ask you to do today with the help of Melinda and Brenda is I'm going to ask you to look at the person to your right, look at the person to your left, or if you don't like either one of them, look at the person behind you. <laughs> and I would like for you to share with that person, 
an example or a time when talking about race or a particular racial moment in your past made you feel very uncomfortable. Think about a time that talking about race or approaching the subject of race brought you discomfort. And as I said earlier today, excluding right now. So anything else is open. (laughs) So please, I'm going to give you just a few minutes to do that. And as I do that, I'm going to pass around Brenda and Melinda. As we proceed through um, our session today, I would like for you to keep passing them. It's like hot potatoes. And then when they stop, whoever has these, one of them when they stop, or you can hold them up if you have a particular story or a question um, throughout the presentation today. And I'll pause and then I'll give you a chance to share that story at selected moments through that presentation. Is that okay? So right now, please share your story with the person next to you. I'm going to get Brenda and Melinda on the, on the job here. They're going to help out. And then at the end of this brief moment, I'm going to ask at least two of you to share that moment, that, that moment of discomfort with the rest of us. And we're, we're going to ask that um, we do it fairly, fairly quickly. All right. So go ahead. Get started. I'll start with you. As now, if I, I just saw Melinda go flying in the back there. <laughs> I want to ask now if I could please have whoever is holding on to Brenda and Melinda to, to share a little bit with us. If you, and if you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. You could pass it off to someone who will, and they'll hold on to it. But if you would please share with us that moment when discussing race, or maybe it was an experience that happened to you, made you feel uncomfortable. Well, I'm probably the only person in this room that has had a a conversation about race at a church potluck. Um, And it was a very (laughs) intense conversation. Um, I had been working, tell me how long I have because I don't don't wanna go too long. Row. Okay. (laughs) Um, As as many of you know, I um, worked for newspapers for 30 years and over the years I've had to cover a lot of racial issues, when you cover crime, when you cover education, mm-hmm. whenever you're covering those things, race is always a part of it. So I had done a column, I had recently been to Oakwood University, which I am an alumnus of, and when I had come back, I wrote a column about how I thought it was good that we still had our historically black colleges to preserve history. I was there and there were the spirituals and, and that sort of thing, and I reflected on that. So when I came to church Sabbath, there's a man in our church, I go to a mixed church, <clears throat> and he wears a Confederate flag a lot of times. And he came up to me and he says, are you Alva James Johnson? I said, yes. And he says, well, I need to talk to you about that column that you wrote. <clears throat> and he had taken the column, he had highlighted all of these parts of the column. And then when we sat down, he said, well, you know, I have a degree from Andrews University in history, and I have a problem with you writing about this, and, um, you know, you, you know, you mentioned that, you know, Oakwood was started, you know, for recently freed slaves. Well, they were not recently freed. And, you know, and this whole thing about holding a black history over, you know, I'm a son of the Confederate. And, and he just went on and on and on. And, and I see history different from you. And you're holding a black history over my history. And I'm, my history is of the South. And I said, well, you know, when you say your history's of the South, which history, I mean, there are a lot of black people that live in the South as well, I mean, which history are you referring to? But I mean, this conversation got so bad that when we got to talking about Native Americans, he said, um, he said, well, you know what was wrong with the Native Americans? They are, they were an inferior race. And I said, do you really believe that? He said, well, survival of the fittest, survival of the fittest. And, and I said, are you, is, that an, is that biblical? I mean, here we are in church, and I just couldn't believe that this is the way he was thinking. And, you know, he talked about the Confederacy, and, you know, slavery wasn't that bad, and people were making a big deal about slavery, and his ancestors fought for, and I said, fought for what? He says, their rights. Their right to do what? And when I said that, he paused. 
I said their right to own slaves. Mm -hmm. And can you see how that may impact, you know, your views about that may impact your, your, your black church members? Mm -hmm. So it was a very uncomfortable conversation to have, mm -hmm. but I'm glad that we had it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he even said he was appreciative that I was willing to hear him talk about it because mm. he says, I could never, you know, I could never express these feelings to anyone, especially a person of color. Mm. But it raised some really uncomfortable feelings for me that we're worshiping together, and these are some of the Absolutely. views that we have. And Absolutely. so, yeah, that was, a, that was a very uncomfortable conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for sharing that with us. We have time for one more. One more. Yes. I got I actually got stuck with this uh, so I guess I'll have to say something <laughs> I'm the last guy on the uh, I was a literature evangelist for probably 18 years serving the publishing ministry um, and what I discovered right away when I first started running lead cards was that one day in particular I knocked on the door it, I was in a uh, primarily a black neighborhood and uh, Little fellow came to the door and he said, Mama, it's a white man. She said, Shut the door, he's a bill collector. <laughs> and so early on, I had to deal with these uncomfortable situations uh, and how to deal with it. And what I discovered was that, uh, of course, asking the Lord to lead, and primarily if I would get myself out of the picture, bring God into it, and related, not color, but, but God, I, I've said, you know, we're here for the same reason. We're, we, we're, we're serving the same God. And anyway, I just wanted to make it short and sweet, but that was my first uncomfortable experience, if I could share that. So. Mm, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that with us. And, and on that note, before we go any further, I would like just to offer a short prayer before we jump into our material today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another time that we can come together and share our perspectives as well as our concerns and answers around a very difficult and emotionally moving topic. We ask that you would let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in, our, in thy sight, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we know this, this issue of race is an issue that is sometimes mm, difficult to, to talk about. It's perhaps an, understand, an understatement. Yet all of us have in our past these experiences, very specific experiences that stick with us, that are in our memories forever, over time. Everyone in this room has had an experience with race. Can you think about that? There are foods everyone in this room have, have not yet tasted. There are places everyone in this room have not yet visited, but everyone in this room has had an uncomfortable experience around talking about race or experiencing racism. Isn't that interesting? One of the things I thought we would delve into today is talking about how we talk about race. Talk is not cheap, as the old saying goes, goes and Talking about race carries certain costs. So my goal today is somewhat ambitious, but I do believe in miracles. I'm a person of faith. So my goal in my prayer is that we had learned a little bit about effective dialogue about race and the cost that it carries and how we can deliberately engage and critical discussion across a spectrum of attitude and responses. What do I mean by that? Usually when we talk about race, we have an approach in which we split people up into camps. People who are racist and people who are victims of racism. Black versus white. Latinos versus white. Um, non-American versus American citizens, undocumented versus documented, and so forth. 
And the attitudes that we carry into these discussions from a variety of, for a variety of topics, we tend to pit one side against the other in this binary. But as we know from the study of race, one of the, one of the major problems that exists with race is that it is set up in a binary that does not allow us to critique nuance, that does not allow us to access the deeper value behind people as individuals and the complexities within individual communities. So I would like to propose that instead of thinking about this camp versus that camp, liberal versus conservative, uh, Democrat versus Republican, I would propose that we look at this across a spectrum. On the one end of that spectrum, looking at this issue of, or this attitude of animosity. People with animosity have deep-seated hatred for people who differ than them in appearance or in racial or ethnic background. On the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are advocates. People who are advocates view race as a problem that is both a structural as well as a personal challenge. And they see their role in it as focusing specifically on actions to help those who are victims and to develop anti-racist responses. And in between, we have varying degrees of responses. With antipathy, characterizing people who have a response to issues of race and racial dialogue that have a strong dislike for discussing and engaging in these topics, but perhaps that dislike is not um, based in any deep-seated hatred. On the other hand, this question of those who are empathetic relates to people who are engaged in these dialogues or engaged with this issue of racial discrimination, and they're able to put themselves in the shoes and able to take on the eyes and the perspectives of people who are very different from them. Now, I was trained as a historian, and one of the things that they trained us to think about as a historian and collecting documents and writing histories about times past, where they would say that you can't simply take a document and begin to write a story unless you have some type of understanding about the context in which the, that document came. Only then can you be able to better understand those stories. So people who practice empathy that I place on this aspect of, of the spectrum are people who practice going behind the eyes of another. There's a saying that you should know other people so well in this world that you can go down in them and come up in yourself. That level of empathy as believers, I would say, is certainly appealing uh, to me. In the middle, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this category of the indifferent. And as you see by the end of this presentation, for me, I view the indifferent as being the number one challenge to having more effective and engaged and transformative discussions about race. The majority, the vast majority of people who, will, who you will discuss race with, or maybe you already have talked about race with, in your lifetime occupy this middle ground, so to speak. And we come from a culture where the middle or moderation is commonly proposed as being ideal. But in reality, what I propose to you today is that the middle of this should actually be here. And I'll share a little bit, um, a, a little bit why. I want to share with you, oops, wrong way. I want to share with you a story of a man I met this, this year. His name is Daryl Davis. He came to Kennesaw State University. Some of you may recognize his face. He has a Netflix doc documentary called Accidental Courtesy. And he does something that I think is really interesting. What Daryl Davis does is he goes around the country and he sets up appointments with avowed racists. 
white supremacists, neo-Nazis, people that are on this end of the spectrum, that have demonstrated outright hatred for people who are different than them, who've expressed it verbally, whose known associates share those same attitudes, and in many instances, who have acted out on that, on that bigotry or on, those, on that violence. Some of these people have criminal records. Some of these people have caused people physical and bodily harm. Daryl Davis has taken it upon himself to make friends with these guys. And you see a picture of him there with, I forget this man's name, who was one of the grand wizards of the Ku Klux Klan in his regalia. But the, the fascinating thing about this relationship is when you look a little bit closer, what he's holding is a certificate of friendship from the Ku Klux Klan to Daryl Davis. And as you read and or listen to Daryl Davis talk and watch more of his story, one of the things that he emphasizes is he starts this process with dialogue, just listening to people, just talking to people, just hearing their views. And over a period of time, he begins to press certain questions and raise certain concerns, but in a very non-judgmental fashion. He doesn't re resort to shaming people. He doesn't resort to calling people names. Um, he doesn't resort to hurting people. <laughs> and over time, what, he, what he's done, I think, is quite phenomenal. He's met with dozens of these men from these organizations. And many of them have renounced their views, cut off ties with those organizations, and actually given him their robes, their regalia, that he's planning to build a museum, an anti-racist museum, that these exhibits will become a part of. He's doing a very powerful work, I think. He has a very specific, I would say, ministry that is reaching out to a very particular aspect of this spectrum in a way that not everybody can do. But he has a particular gift here that has made him particularly effective. Now, when he came to Kennesaw State, where I work, um, we saw his documentary. He talked with us for about an hour or so. And there was a particular moment in this documentary that the students attending this event were really interested in talking about more. There's a moment that he goes to Baltimore. And he goes to Baltimore shortly after the death of Freddie Gray, this young man who was killed by a police in the back of a, a transport, transportation van. And he arrives there. There's numerous Black Lives Matter activists on the street getting ready to march to protest the killing of Freddie Gray. And they ask, when they see him, the camera catches this moment of tension that you wouldn't believe. You can just feel it. And through the next few minutes, you understand where this tension is coming from. Many of these young activists are in their 20s, maybe early teens, and they look at Daryl Davis as someone who is doing thing, a work that is interesting, but also someone who is taking resources that could be applied to a very, very real and imminent threat in black and brown America and spending it on people at the far end of the spectrum, the vast majority of which will never change their views. So a lot of them, there was this moment, deep moment of tension in the film. They go out to have um, a, a lunch, and in that lunch, they, in, they get involved in a very, very tense verbal altercation back and forth. So the students I was with at this event asked him about that particular moment in the film. He had many regrets about that moment. But one thing that became particularly clear to us, as well as him in that process, is that his gifts and his approach to racial dialogue was best suited at that end of the spectrum. And that although that there were people on the other end of the spectrum who were operating in this space, that needed his help, 
and did not receive it. We were able to recognize that both of these types of work, addressing people here and addressing people and empowering people on this end, are equally important. I want to share with you something else along the lines of this generation gap. There's a, in full disclosure, one of the things I should mention to you is that I am from Generation X, so you can do the math. <laughs> right on the, I'm right on the cusp. Um, but Generation X and millennials have been characterized as having different views about race than their predecessors. Many youth in generation, you know many of you have seen them in the classroom or walking around campus, you know that there's, some, there's something different to millennials. They've got a different thing, the technology thing. Some people say they're narcissistic. That's another talk. I'll come back and talk with you about that. But um, they certainly, there's, a, there's certainly a different global outlook when dealing with millennials. I um, am in, within Generation X, and one of the things that many people who are from previous generations, like the baby boomers, as well as the silent generation, um, may fail to consider, is that millennials, Generation X, were raised in the post-civil rights era. We were raised on a steady diet of Eyes on the Prize documentaries. There was a Martin Luther King Jr. holiday and now a monument. So people from this aspect of the generational waterfall feel very comfortable having conversations in many instances about race, sometimes in ways that their parents and grandparents may not. However, there's a caveat here. One of the things that I think is interesting about looking at Generation X and baby boomers is where they are having these conversations about race, which is often online. And secondly, how these conversations and views about race impact or differentiate them from their um, parents and their grandparents. One of the key problems that we've seen across generations is the problem of the grand villain. Many in the Generation X and um, millennial category view racial problems as stemming from single grand villains of the old Confederacy for one or of the civil rights movement. So people like uh, Robert E. Lee or people like um, Nathan Bedford Forrest or people like Bull Connor, Laurie Pritchett, these famous people that you see in documentaries who then become somewhat of the epitome of racist thinking and become locked away and placed in a particular period in the past. They are much more um, challenged when asked to think about the way that racism works within structures, the way that racism operates within culture, and the way that racism lives within institutions. Despite these um, intrinsic differences, so to speak, a key problem that I find fascinating is millennials view themselves as being much more progressive in terms of their racial views than their parents and their grandparents. And in some instances, some scholars have pointed to these differences or this this. Um, this this distancing of themselves along the, along the lines of racial enlightenment, for lack of a better term, um, causes this notion of self-righteousness that blinds many in my generation and those that follow me from broader racial problems. So in other words, let me package it like this. Many Generation X and Xers and Millennials look down upon baby boomers and the silent generation because they accuse them of a lapse in moral leadership on racial issues. They say, your generation was not addressing racial problems. Your generation gave rise to people like Bull Connor. Your generation did not speak out 
on issues of injustice. Your generation allowed Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy to be assassinated, etc. But then when these same millennials are polled on their own views, we find some serious problems. For one, we find that their views on a host of racial issues are not much different than their parents, with one exception, which we won't go into. So if you ask, um, if you poll as the University of Chicago did in this NORC survey, and they ask people, um, what are your views of blacks? Do you oppose living in a 50% black neighborhood, right? How they responded is, if you ask someone from the silent generation, 28% of them says, oh, there's no way I'm living in there. You could laugh because, <laughs> yeah, it's no, oh, it's no way I'm living in there. It's a serious subject, but yeah, it's fast. It's, 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 it's funny. Some aspects are funny. All right. If you ask baby boomers, 20% of them are like, no. If you ask Generation X, 16%. And millennials are 15%. So there's, you know, this is a very small difference. If you ask whites overall in this category, close to 20% said that they would oppose living in a neighborhood that's 50% black. I want you to think about this, because we have very good data on this as it relates to the housing market. One of the things that we know, since 1955, the United States has become much more segregated, not only by race, but also now by class increasingly. And one of the things that we also know is that when a neighborhood reaches the magical number of about 20%, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's black, African-American, Jamaican, Haitian, Latino, Central American, Hispanic, Asian. When that number reaches about 20%, a phenomenon known as white flight begins, where whites begin to move out of that neighborhood and move to another neighborhood. This is a very tragic process. Um, there's many reasons for it that we don't have time to go into today, but it's, it's certainly something that is backed up by the data. I didn't mention this in the previous um, um, presentation, but one of the things I want you to think about also is how the same process takes place within the church. What's fueling white flight within the church? I'm not talking about historically black institutions and historically white institutions. I'm talking about what happens when institutions begin to become integrated and racially and culturally diverse. Does this same phenomenon exist? I want to move on to the, to the second major issue. We, we spent just a little bit of time talking about um, this end of the spectrum, the animosity and the antipathy spectrum. I want to move into the second aspect of the presentation, which is getting at this problem of indifference. There's a lot of people who would look at the animosity part of the spectrum and would say, those people, those white supremacists, those neo-Nazis, they are the number one problem to racial progress in this country. I had an opportunity to visit the Southern Poverty Law Center, and it's an it's amazing place. They're doing amazing um, interracial um, work down there in addressing violence and hate crimes in this country. But one of the fascinating things that I see when I visit there and in my own travels and my own um, research is that the number one, the number one the most important impediment to addressing issues of racial dialogue and racial progress are not the people on the animosity side of that spectrum. The white supremacists and the neo-Nazis who have made up their minds about people who are racially or culturally different from them a long time ago, either due to a lack of education or due to some personal harm or any other issue, those people are not the most significant impediment to race, racial progress. The most significant barrier preventing progress on this issue are people who are in that middle, who occupy the indifferent zone. These individuals here 
where the majority of resistance comes from. I want to talk about this a little bit more so you can understand uh, what I mean. There's a, there's a text in the Bible that says, multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision. And really, the key problem with the vast majority of people on any college campus, in any church, in any place where there's a gathering of people and there's discussion on this racial issue, the number one issue with that people are facing as it relates to race is being indifferent, being apathetic, not really caring. It can go one way. It could go the other. And one thing that I would suggest to you is that the decision to be indifferent is a conscious or in many instances, unconscious decision to support the status quo, which essentially means it's a decision to support racism. That's a bold claim. Them dars fighting words. Yeah! (laughs) The people who occupy this area here are here not because of a lack of information. Not because of any personal injury or personal issue. When I was a kid, this black guy punched me in the nose. I don't like black people. People who occupy this part of the spectrum are here because they have the information, but they choose not to act upon it or to engage it in any meaningful way. And in doing so, they serve as a barrier that prevents people from moving forward on this issue. How do they do that? This is problem of false moral equivalency. Have you heard of this before? Often people will say, on the other hand, now in terms of moderation, that's a very good thing to, to have, to be even-handed in, your, in one's analysis, to consider the facts on both sides of any issue. But when drawing false equivalencies between a moral ill and good becomes an excuse for inaction, one becomes complicit in the institution itself. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Around 1960, J. Edgar Hoover, who was former um, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, called Martin Luther King a communist and a national security threat to the United States. Now, Martin Luther King had at the core of his campaign the idea of a beloved community, meaning that the world and the United States could be transformed through the process of love, where people could come together in one community. Right? I find that stance hardly um, equivalent to the notion of the Soviet Union that could hurl hydrogen bombs across the Atlantic Ocean to destroy nuclear targets. Yet these false moral equivalencies tend to continue and tend to prevail within this middle part of the spectrum. And I'm bringing them up here particularly as it relates to racial dialogue because as you embark on racial dialogue with the SOAR program and other initiatives on this campus, one of the key barriers that you will find in these interchanges is not people who come without the knowledge that they need to engage in dialogue, but people who have the knowledge but use it in such a way to neutralize action. This is the threat here. Going back to the example of Daryl Davis, we need to steer away from using shame to to end dialogue on this end of the spectrum. But I don't know, maybe a little shame (laughs) could be used to push the dialogue to go somewhere here, right? A lot of this is intellectual laziness. A lot of this is dishonesty. A lot of this is a lack of caring. But all of this, all of it, 
is redeemable. You can change it. You can address it. So I would challenge you, as you begin to engage and sustain dialogue um, following this series and other series, that you at least spend a little bit of time, perhaps the majority of your effort within this part of the spectrum, getting those who are indifferent to know that their silence is complicity and that by, and that by engaging them and activating them, you can begin to move towards this aspect of the spectrum. Oops, I'm going to turn that back in time. There's a famous Martin Niemöller quote that you may have heard before. Niemöller was a prominent Protestant pastor who was an outspoken um, critic of Adolf Hitler, and he spent the last seven years in a concentration camp for his opposition. But there's a poem that he, that he wrote that has re, been rewritten many times where names are taken out and swatched out, but the original one read like this. First they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. It's a powerful poem. And I think it's so powerful because it points squarely at this problem of indifference. We view indifference, we view neutrality as being the safe zone. But in reality, neutrality is the danger zone. I want to move on to the to the last part. And this, this last section, we're going to talk on about the last aspect of the spectrum to the region here. Moving from an empathy to advocacy. When we begin to talk about talking about race, you're going to find that there's a lot of people who will show up that are very empathetic, who will show up who are advocates, who want to get to work. But far too often, in my brief experience over the last 10, 15 years, I have found that the way that we set up our dialogue exits these people out and prevents them from using their God-given talents in a way that, that is most necessary. I want to share some examples of some of the problems as well as the approaches to this particular aspect of the spectrum using some examples from what we've been encountering just south to you at Kennesaw, as well as some historical examples. This guy you see here is Ulysses S. Grant. Not this one, this one. <laughs> this is my friend Ernesto Silva. I'll, I'll, admit, I'll talk about him in a moment. Ulysses S. Grant is best known as a general, one of the prominent generals during the Civil War, but also a very important president. And one of the things that fascinates me about the life of Ulysses S. Grant is not so much his battlefield know-how, nor his efficiency as a president, but really how he was able to move from the zones of antipathy and indifference to the zone of advocacy during the Reconstruction era. Now, there is nothing in the life of Ulysses S. Grant that you would read about or that you would study during his early life in Ohio and in Pennsylvania that you would think prepared him to be an advocate for racial equality in the United States. He was always just an indifferent type of guy on the race question. There's even moments in his past that he exhibited very racist attitudes towards Jews, very anti-Semitic moments in terms of his field order. But when he gave his inaugural address, he was the president that directly followed Andrew Johnson. He gave his first inaugural address. He made it clear that equality for all, including African Americans, would be the number one priority of his presidency. I think we should study more people like Ulysses S. Grant, people who were moved from antipathy and indifference to advocacy.
In my opinion, we know far too much about people who are trapped in the region of animosity. We memorialize far too many people in the region of animosity and far too few people in the region of empathy and advocacy. As a history teacher, you know, we talk in our classes about vast periods of American history. I do some global history as well. And I'm always shocked by the pure fascination that students have when we point out examples of people who are not perfect, but who are striving to make a change. Most students, before taking my class, the only thing that we know about Ulysses S. Grant, uh, he was a drunk and bad with money. That's what, like 70% of the American population. <laughs> much, of, much of those conclusions certainly have been discredited in, in new scholarship, but perhaps the most compelling aspects of his life we know very little about, like how he used his executive, his executive office to help implement the anti-Ku Klux Klan um, legislation, as well as ensuring that federal troops remained in the South to make sure that the United States became the democratic uh, society that they so desperately hoped for. Instead, what we know much more about are the problems of Reconstruction, all the aspects that didn't work, the mass violence, and certainly people who would be much more towards this aspect to the, of the spectrum. I want to use the last few moments I have to, to talk with you about a different um, presidential commission and work that is going on that I think connects historically to some of the work of Ulysses S. Grant, but also raises questions about the promise of dialogue. You see me here seated with some of my friends from Kennesaw State University, and the name of this um, organization that was formed in 2010 was called the Presidential Commission on Racial and Ethnic Dialogue. It was started by the president of our university after um, a, a bit of a boo-boo that um, they got themselves into when Cora Harris's family donated a huge tract of land to our university. Cora Harris was a phenomenal woman in the 19th century. She was a prolific author, a staunch feminist, and a writer um, many, many times over. But the issue that became particularly controversial in her past was that so much of her writings were in local papers arguing for the lynching and mob um, killings of African Americans in the South. So this donation of land became a very charged question on our campus on what should be done with this land. Should this land be accepted and used as an anti-racism center to educate people about some of the shortcomings of Cora Harris and her time? Or should, it, should the gift be rejected outright? Many of the faculty and staff and students chimed in on this issue, and the outcome was pure chaos. So what the president of our institution decided to do was to form a commission of faculty, staff, and students to not only advise him on these matters as they related to race, but also to create a space for dialogue around questions of racial and ethnic concern. You see seated here, all, all of us, this, she was not part of, this is one of my friends from New York, but she's important too for later talk though. Um, all of us were commissioners of this, um, commission chairs rather, of this commission. And um, we learned some very, very valuable lessons along the way. I'll share two of them very quickly with you before I go to the conclusion. The first one is that for any dialogue, any strategic dialogue on race to be effective, there must be broad feedback, broad discussion across campus, and the people who are on the advocacy side of the spectrum must be forefront in those initiatives. These questions, these dialogues, and if they're to be effective, they cannot focus exclusively 
on shaming people towards this aspect. And they cannot, be, um, ex- they cannot focus explicitly on staying in this territory here where there's these false moral equivalencies and kind of these in- endless runaround questions that never come to any action. They have to be based in dialogue that is authentic and dialogue that is coming from people who are motivated to move and in dialogue that will result in engagement and action. The second thing that we discussed or we found through this process is that when you engage dialogue authentically at this level and when there's a variety of discussions around the table, many other issues that you thought were tangential to the discussion of race get solved and come to the fore. We don't have time to go into it, but there's discussion after discussion of race, other issues related to Islamophobia began to come to the fore. Issues related to homophobia as well came to the fore. So much so that by the next year, the president decided that he would expand this commission on race, and it would not just be one commission, but it would be seven commissions. A commission, a commission on gender and work life, a commission on sustainability, a, submission, a commission on disability, a commission on veterans affairs, and so forth. And out of those, out of this structure, we began to understand the real um, politic or the real-time manifestation of this fancy term called intersectionality. That just because somebody was disabled did not mean that they didn't understand or experience prejudice. Or because someone was a woman, is a woman, they didn't necessarily, um, they wanted also to work on issues of race or issues with veterans. So these movers on this side of the the equation, these advocates and these empathizers, we found, actuated action amongst a whole variety of issues on our campuses. One of the themes that we also discussed is how can we move the discussion on race away from its concentration among just African Americans to engage the perspectives of people across the diaspora, people who identify not only as black, but people who identify as white, Latino, Asian, and so forth. And one of the initiatives that came out of that, so you see my friend Ulysses S. Grant here and myself. (laughs) This is Ernesto Silva. Um, He's a professor of Latino and Latin American studies. We decided that we wanted to increase the dialogue among African Americans on campus and Latinos on campus. You're going to see some interesting data on this in a moment, so I had to make sure, I had to make sure it gets in um, at this point. Because we found that a lot of these communities were experiencing similar phenomena on campus, but they were suffering in silos, so to speak. So we began a series that brought these two groups together, as well as other allies who might not identify as Um, Latino or African American, but are empathizers and advocates. And we did two things. We created a film series, largely his creation, and we created a learning community. I heard from your, the slides earlier that, you know, you have a a awesome plan dealing with freshmen and incoming students. But one of the things that we began to think about very carefully is we had this problem at Kennesaw, we called it the frosh problem. Many institutions of our size have it. That freshmen and sophomores will come, and then they'll get forgotten about, and they'll drop off. Sometime around their fresh, freshman and sophomore year, which is called the frosh problem. So one of the things that we discovered is that by implementing a first-year learning program, you can build a community with, with students where they share professors, they share classes, and you develop themes within these classes that appeal to particular communities of interest. So one of these affinity groups that we found is that African-American and Latino students share many challenges, many similar challenges, even though they talk about them in different ways. So we said, why not create a learning community that brings together African-American and Latino students to allow them to talk about these issues while learning and getting their general education requirements completed? And we call, the first one we call From Latin America with Love. The second one we call Critical Dialogues in Black and Brown. 
And it's been a fairly successful endeavor. This is not a self-pat on the back. But one of the things that I was very, very proud of is this past spring, our first cohort graduated. And people who began this experience way on this aspect of the spectrum, indifference or antipathy, ended being advocates. And very often, they were not the people that you expected. They were the people who were sleeping in class. They were the people who were breathing heavy when you, when you, oh, we have to talk about this again. Something happened by engaging them in a systematic fashion over a sustained period of time when we linked our dialogue to direct action. Something happened that transformed them to advocates. So I want to conclude on this note. In order to have effective dialogue about race, I would argue that we must challenge the dominant narrative. We must insist that anti-racism is part of a three-pronged structure, inclusion as well as multiculturalism. We have to activate those who are empathetic and advocates and get them in positions where these dialogues are productive and lead to action. And lastly, I would say that we need to use our faith and our intellect to create and expect the miraculous through our conversations instead of settling on the silence of the status quo. After all, why be a believer? Why even bother to be a believer if only the ordinary is possible? What's the use of faith if we have to accept that which we have already been given. It's my belief that we've been sent as light into the world and as salt into the world. And perhaps talking about these issues is just one small aspect of our seasoning um, to, the, to the world. Thank you, and that's, that's it for today. I would like to in, engage some questions if we, if we have time. Yeah. Brenda and Melinda, where are you? Who has a question, Brenda and Melinda? There's Brenda, there's Melinda. <laughs> well, I thank, I thank you for, for um, allowing me to share in these moments, and I'm so excited about the work that you are doing. Please keep up the good work.